Hello, I'm Paul Beckwith. I'm at the University of Ottawa Laboratory for Paleoclimatology. This is my uh, website, just Google paulbeckwith.net and you can, uh, or, or just Google, go on YouTube and Google Paul Beckwith Climate Change or something like that. And I've actually produced hundreds of videos on, you know, why I think we're in a climate emergency now, what's happened to the climate in the past, present, and where I expect we'll be going in the future. I rely on donations through PayPal. You don't need a PayPal account, just a credit card. I rely on that for my work in producing these videos. So in this video, I'm gonna talk about something that, okay, in a previous video, I talked about lots of different crazy ideas that people are trying to use to explain what's happening with the weather disruption and climate disruption that we're experiencing. Um, in this particular video, I'm going to focus on the idea, you know, the claim, I'm going to debunk the claim that people are using to say that, you know, we're getting cold weather in North America, or we did a few months ago, so we're on the way to a grand solar minimum. It's got nothing to do with fossil fuels and greenhouse gases, etc. This is a this is a crazy claim, but I'm gonna talk, I'm gonna, this video is focused on. Um, in the, in a previous video, cockamamie ideas to explain climate change, you can Google it. I talked about HARP, like the H-A, ARP idea, you know, sending radio waves up into the ionosphere to disrupt weather patterns. I talked about the polar shift. I'll do a separate video on the polar shift because it is shifting, but the time scale certainly can't explain what we're seeing with weather and climate patterns. Um, I also talked about uh, the idea of chemtrails and uh, you know, invoke the tooth fairy or Santa Claus, you know, pick your, pick your explanation. I mean, the, the people are going into contortions trying to explain phenomena and yet they're not, they won't just recognize the Occam's razor, the simplest explanation. We've changed the chemistry of the atmosphere and oceans with our greenhouse gases and we're suffering the consequences. So one of the interesting things is to try to figure out the motivations behind people um, who have these cockamamie ideas. And I came across this book. I was at the University of Ottawa bookstore and I knew of the existence of this book here, but I purchased a copy. Um, it looks really interesting. The Mathematical Modeling of Zombies. It's by Robert Smith, question mark. His last name, you know, Smith is a very common name, so he put a question mark. So he goes officially with Smith question mark. So this modeling was done a few years ago at University of Ottawa, and it went viral, uh, pun intended. And I think, uh, I think it can be rewritten with the idea of mathematical modeling of chemtrailers, of climate change deniers, of harp uh, people, of polar shift people, of choose your, choose your crazy reason for trying to f explain why our weather is messing up as opposed to what I've been saying, you know, the reality of the situation I've been talking about for a long time. This is a hilarious book here. You know, some of the coefficients in the model, they have a, the coefficient of cowardice, the probability that a human who survives a zombie encounter will go into hiding the bravado coefficient, probability a human who does not run away after a zombie encounter joins the militia. So we have the worker, the, the human population, we have a fraction of them is the militia population, and then we have the zombie population. So all of these things are modeled. You know, there's different parameters. Here's a probability that a militia member encounters a worker, will accidentally kill the worker, you know, and there's all kinds of different parameters. And then there's a lot of modeling done with various assumptions, and then you can plot graphs. So here we have human population in a few different models, decreasing zombie population being high, decreasing, increasing, remove population because, you know, humans can be converted to zombies, right, by being attacked, being bitten, transfer of bodily fluids, 
zombies, um, in order to get rid of zombies, you have to shoot them in the brain or decapitate them, and then they become in the removed population here. So you can model all of these sort of things um, using ordinary differential equations, etc. And I think that a lot of the information in this can be applied to, you know, mo mathematical modeling of of uh, people who have these cockamamie crazy ideas about climate change. So that's the point, the purpose of another video. So um, let me get the lights to get better contrast and let's get right into the solar stuff. Okay, so here's what we have. This is from the, so basically if what I did is I went into Google Images Okay, Google, 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 Google Images, going to Google Images, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Radiative Forcing Solar Cycle. Okay, and uh, I just clicked on this particular guy here and expanded it. So this is showing you the radiative forcing by emissions and drivers. So here we have the greenhouse gases, CO2, methane, CFCs, HCFCs nitrous oxide these are all contributing to radiative forcing and the values are here with levels of confidence then we have uh some other gases we have co non-metallic volatile organic compounds noxs um, and then we have the aerosol effect cloud adjustments albedo change due to land use now here's changes in solar irradiance okay so the change the sunlight changes in in an 11 year cycle because of uh the changes of sunspots in the sun and there's changes in the magnetic field so we get a a change in solar irradiance but the effect here is 0 0.05 or you know it's in the range 0 to 0 0.10 and compare that number to um, in 2011, the total radiative forcing relative to 1750 was 2.29 watts per uh, square watts per square meter. Okay, watts per square meter. And here we go. 0 0.05 is due to changes in the sun. Okay, up to 0 0.10. You know, 0 0.10 would be uh, one part in 230. Okay, so the changes in the sun are, neg are in negligible forcing. Okay, it's not the sun changing. Okay, <clears throat> of course the sun is very important. It provides all the energy to earth, but it's not changing. The irradiance from the sun is changing so small, it's having a negligible effect on the change in solar irradiance at the top of the atmosphere, which has a very, very small effect on climate. Okay, it's dwarfed by human, the effect from human emissions. Here's another image from this same site here. Okay, just Google this and just have a look for yourself. Okay, this is from, um, okay, this is from the IPCC 2013. The sun's contribution to climate change since 1750 is slightly above nothing. Okay, I want to emphasize this again. It's very, very small effect. Okay, here's some data, some images. It shows the effects over the last thousand years from volcanoes. Whenever there's a large volcano, uh, there's, if there's enough ejection up into the upper atmosphere, the stratosphere, it puts uh, dust particles, it puts sulfur dioxide. It's the sulfur dioxide that blocks some of the sunlight Create, creating a reduction in irradiance. This is, uh, and look, you can see the scale here. This is zero, this is minus one, about minus 1 1.5 down to here, large volcanoes. Now, solar irradiance forcing over the same time period is, th the scale here is zero, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 watts per square meter. Very, very small change, and it's not changing that quickly over time. It's got the solar cycle. Um, you know, we're moving through the cosmos, etc. There's reasons why there is a small change, but it's small. And then all other forcings are huge. It's not the sun, sorry. This is a graph. Um, you know, a lot of work was done 
um, in the 80s and 90s because there, you know, before, because there seemed to be some sort of pattern here, correlation, solar activity and temperature. But look what happened here in 1980. Temperature skyrock went skyrocketing upwards, solar activity tapered down. Okay, if you see a lot of fraudulent people would only put this part of the graph here showing, hey, there's a connection here, you know, neglecting to put anything from 1980 onwards. So be careful about that. You know, it's not the sun once again. Here's another attribution study. This one was done um, early 90s. And again, it shows you the modeled and observed temperatures, greenhouse gases coming up, solar is uh, not causing this big spike here. Neither is ozone, neither is volcanic, and this is a sulfate effect. Again, a disconnect, okay? It's not the sun. Okay, if you wanna look at the uh, more of these bar charts and see the evolution of them, here, this is a real climate article showing the evolution of radiative forcing bar charts. Just Google it to find it. Okay, so this is um, where we are. This is the one I showed you, okay, in the AR5 version, okay, um, of the IPCC report. Total forcing up to 2011, 2.29, 0 to 0 0.10 for solar radiance. radiance. Changes in solar irradiance, 0 0.05. So take 0 0.05 divided by 2.29. It's a very small effect. Okay, um, this shows you some of the original bar chart showing radiative forcing. This is from Hansen et al. in 1981, showing um, the main different effects here. Okay, and then you can go back and see uh, the net anthropogenic greenhouse forcing again from Hansen in the first assessment report, and you can follow the uh, timelines, the third assessment report, et cetera, and see how things have changed. And the sun, so the component from the sun is actually, you know, as we get more and more science, it's decreasing. So in 2007, you can see the solar radiate, irradiance effect was zero, thought to be 0 0.12, 0 0.06 to 0 0.30, Okay, this is 2007 AR4, you know, with the forcing 1.6. This number has gone up to 2.29. This number has gone up to 0 0.05. Okay, which is right here in the latest. Okay, so quite clearly, you know, as we get more and more information, the solar effect is smaller and smaller. So now just Google solar, go to Google images and Google solar cycle and you get this type of thing. There's all kinds of graphs talking about the modern minimum, Dalton minimum, modern maximum, things like that. So let's have a look. I'll select some of these and discuss those in detail. Okay, so the first one is, I believe I just clicked on this guy here and came up with this article here. So this is a fairly recent article about where we're heading. This is an idea, this is the sun. There's a couple sunspots here and here. Sunspots are dark areas putting out less energy, but around the edge of them, there's more energy put, even being put out. So when there's sunspot activity, there's more emissions, more radiation from the sun. But as I said, it's much, it's much, much smaller. So this is a total sunspotless days in different years, but let's go here. So here we are here, we're in cycle 24 right now. Cycle 22 was here, uh, cycle 23, cycle 24. So the peak is smaller than previous cycles. And here's where we are right now in uh, 2018. Okay, cycle 24. Um, 400 years of sunspot observations, just counting the spots on the sun. And we see there were very few sunspots here, 1650 to 1700. This was the Maunder minimum a bit cooler on, on the planet at that time. Um, this is a Dalton minimum. We had the mini ice age sort of in Europe. And then here we are with the sunspots now, and it looks like we're heading to a slightly uh, over time. Now remember this is heading to a slightly less active sun. And this, uh, but the time scale, these are 11 year cycles. So abrupt climate change causing massive changes from one year to the next, you can't attribute that to a longer cycle. 
I'm going to continue this in a second video, so thank you for paying attention.